and welcome. Are we on? You don't know? Well, I'll just talk loud. I've been told I do that by my wife. Good to see you here this, there we go, good to see you here this morning. As always, it's uh, Sunday mornings are an adventure during the time of the COVID. We're looking out and I know there's a few families with little ones who are all sick. And so I'm glad that at least some of us uh, uh, brought our kids today. The youngest here today is my son. And also thank you to Karina and to Cliff for bringing out their children as well. And I think that's about it. Uh, Oh, yep, no. Uh. Hannah, oh, that's right. And uh, you guys brought, ugh. look at that. Kids galore here this morning. <laughs> From the look of it, you're not having Sunday school this morning, but uh, oh, interesting, interesting times. Oh, we got Nora. There we go. Anyhow, let us <laughs> start with just a few announcements uh, before we open in prayer and, and get started with our real purpose for gathering. Uh, a few uh, announcements. One, uh, we know, and this is maybe more for people watching at home who haven't been able to come in person. If you're still looking to get your boxes for the or, uh, your offering envelopes, talk to Cliff or send Cliff a, a, a message, text, email, give him a phone call even, and then he will make sure he gets your boxes out and gets them to you or will put them on the information booth so that you have you can get those um, boxes that would be fantastic uh, in other announcements we'd also ask you to continue to um, we're not going to be keeping track of scripture reading this year like we did last year when it, when it was our theme but we still want to wrap up last year and have a final total and so if you haven't told us uh, what you read last year, even if you never told us the first in the first place and you have a whole bunch to give us, let us know in the next week or so that, so that we can just get up there and, and announce that, and that would be just fantastic. We'd really appreciate that. On the 31st, we have a church business meeting coming up, and uh, so you will be getting more information on that as uh, time goes on. We do want to announce it. it the information, the agenda will be posted uh, very soon. But one thing that's very important for you to note is that um, we are looking at making a few constitutional changes. And when I say a few, I mean, well, an awful lot. Not that we're changing, not that we're changing what we're doing. We're not just, we didn't just throw it all open willy-nilly, but there were some things that needed to be adjusted. They're not, the government now doesn't want us to even call them a constitution, it's just bylaws. And, and so we had to put the two together and make one. And so then there was some double up that had to be gotten rid of. There was a few things that were changed simply because it wasn't how we were operating as a, as a church. There were some spelling things. So uh, we, we had to make some changes. We've sent that out, but we also have some copies here. Um, and one, is the one of the things is a letter, and this goes through and it just basically explains all of the changes, the rationale for the changes, um, so that you can go through them. And then there's also on, uh, so these are on the information uh, booth as well as the old constitution and the new constitution so that you can read through, uh, read through them, make sure that we're not doing anything that we shouldn't be doing, uh, although that definitely wasn't our plan. And uh, just uh, so that you, you know you're up to date and then we can discuss these things at the church business meeting, uh, which will be by Zoom for those, uh, just because we know we can't always gather uh, in this, the ways that we used to. Uh, and also, if you have any questions about that, please let us know, uh, hopefully, you know, at least a week in advance. If, if you have a question, there's a good chance somebody else has that exact same question, and that just gives us an opportunity to, to maybe do the research that we need to do. Maybe it's something we haven't thought about before. Uh, I think that's it for the announcements that I'm going to make. Please um, read through your bulletin, see what else is, is going on. Let's just take a, a, an opportunity, though, to open with a word of prayer before uh, Ben comes in and leads us in worship. Lord, uh, we do. We thank you so much for this day, for the, just the opportunities that it holds. Uh, one of the greatest opportunities that we have is to come into this place and to worship you. And we thank you for that. 
Lord, thank you that we can gather freely. Thank you that we can open up your word, that your spirit is here among us to uh, interpret it, to guide us into your truth. Lord, we just want to know you and know you more. So help us in these things this morning, God, we pray. God, help us as we worship. Lord, may we focus um, on you. May we turn all of our thoughts uh, that are from the outside, that are our distractions, our worries, and our concern. Turn those off, Lord God, that we can sing of your praises, and that we can remind ourselves of your greatness, or that you would be glorified. God, go, go before us this morning, we pray. Bless us in all that we do, and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ben and team, please. Good morning. Would you stand with us as you're able? Let's worship together. Lord God, we just thank you that you are completely worthy of this worship that we can give to you, Lord. And we thank you that, that we have this freedom and ability to do, to do this, to gather and just lift up your name. And I pray in everything we do this today, Lord, we just glorify you and uh, we praise you today, Lord. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice. Trembles at his voice. How great is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God? And all will see how great, how great is our God. And age to age. Time is in His hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great! me how great is our God and all will see how great how great is our God name above all names worthy of all praise my heart will sing how great is our God. Name above all names, you are worthy of all praise. My heart will sing how great is our God. great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Then sings my soul, my 
Savior God to How great Thou art How great Thou art Then sings my soul My Savior God to How great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God how great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope Who could imagine so great a mercy What heart could fathom Such boundless grace The God of ages Stepped down from glory To wear my sin And bear my shame The cross is spoken I am forgiven King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain, there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free, hallelujah. Its grip on me, you have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise, your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your very body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has 
has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. It's grip on me You have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living hope Hallelujah Praise the one who set me free Hallelujah Death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope jesus christ my living hope oh god you are my living hope Lord God, we just thank you that you are our living hope, and that means present and active right now. And we just thank you, Lord, that you have set us free and, and that you've breached that chasm between us and, and you. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for that this morning and pray that we never forget that. That's the m- biggest, most important news we've ever had and ever can and ever will. Just thank you, Lord. Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Hope is stirring, hearts are yearning for you. We long. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away. Hosanna. Hosanna. You are the God who saves us. Worthy of all our praises, Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus, hear the sound of hearts Turning to you, we turn to you. In your kingdom, broken lives are made new. You make us new. Cause when we see you, we find strength. To face the day in your presence, all our fears are washed away. The washed away, Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus, 
When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us, we welcome you here. Hosanna, 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 Hosanna.
Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. The Lord. Lord, just help us not to forget that amazing love that in the midst of our depravity, every part of us that didn't deserve any of this, you sent your son for us, Lord, and, and that's a grace that, that was just beyond us, really. And I pray, Lord, that you help us to be able to accept that grace and also let it pour out into the lives of others around us as we learn what it means to give beyond anything that we can imagine, Lord. And we just praise you for that. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind. I see so clearly Hallelujah, grace like rain falls down on me Hallelujah, all my stains are washed away Grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear.
Scripture is taken from Galatians chapter 2, beginning with verse 11. And this is Paul speaking. But when Cephas, and that would be Peter, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. But if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Sunday school, kids, all one and perhaps two of you. Oh, you got it, Nora. How are you doing? Looks like it's just us today. Do you want to go to Sunday school? Okay, that works. I was thinking maybe you could like read my sermon. I'll just go to Sunday school. You're a good kid. I like you. Let's, can I pray with you? And then you can go to Sunday school. Let's do that. God, thank you. Thank you for our children. Thank you for the promise that they are, the hope that they are, uh, the tremendous joy and the tremendous responsibility. God, thank you for Nora and all of our other young uh, kids, so many who, of whom are sick. God, I just pray you'll continue to be with them. Teach them your ways. May they know you. May they love you deeply. So just 
bless Nora today as she uh, goes off to learn. And God, I do want to think of all those other ones out there right now who are, are sick with colds and whatnot. Uh, God, just heal them up and uh, speak to them today in some way as well, we pray. And I just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, young lady. As we uh, go to our time of prayer, it's going to be a little different this morning. Um, first, I'm going to read a, a, a letter. Um, our government recently passed a bill, Bill C-4, and uh, it's not one that churches are completely thrilled with. And so a number of churches, uh, churches, denominations across the country have gotten together and written a, a letter, made a statement, and they have asked that... Uh, as many churches as possible would read this statement just so we're all on the same page. And uh, so let me just read this and then we are going to have a, a, a little time of prayer as well. Uh, so this is just a statement on, uh, a national statement on B-Sil Bill C-4. I can read. It says, this past week marked a monumental change in Canadian law and society with the enactment of federal Bill C-4, which amends the criminal code. The law's status pur stated purpose is to outlaw conversion therapy. We strongly oppose the coercive and unscientific therapeutic practices this bill was introduced to address. We appreciate and affirm the desire of parliamentarians to protect the vulnerable. However, we are deeply concerned that the effective reach of the legislation could be extended far beyond its stated purpose. Because its definition of conversion therapy is vague, many are concerned that it could capture parents, pastors, and counselors who teach a biblical understanding of sexuality in a variety of situations. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees our freedoms of religion, conscience, thought, belief, expression, and association. It is our prayer that the law will be applied and clarified as needed in such a way as to honor these charter protections. We recognize that the greater, greatest danger facing the Canadian church is not that we might face criminal prosecution, but rather that we might compromise in our teaching of the word of God or fall silent in our proclamation of the gospel. Along with church leaders of like conviction across Canada, we stand before you today to pledge that we are committed to obeying God above all others, with the Lord's help, we will continue to proclaim the whole counsel of God without fear or favor. This includes God's life-giving design for human beings, made in his image, male and female, with sexual intimacy reserved for the covenantal union of a man and a woman. We will continue to issue the call to repent of all kinds of sin and to believe the gospel, knowing we all have sinned and that salvation through Jesus is the one true hope for the world. We continue to love and serve all people in our community without distinction in Jesus' name. As we press on in the work of ministry, we trust our Heavenly Father to guard us and keep us and to work out his greater purposes for our good and glory. We continue to pray for our government and to plead with the Lord to have mercy on our needy land. Um, this is kind of a big deal. Uh, I, I completely agree with the letter that uh, there are forms of conversion therapy that are complete and utter rubbish, that are harmful. Uh, I honestly believe the only conversion therapy that works is conversion to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A change within our heart is the only thing that is going to make a difference. Um, but yeah, there is some definite concern. So we ask that you'd be in prayer about this, and we want to pray now for this and for our country and just even for our upcoming message. So let's just bow uh, together in, in prayer. Lord, um, we thank you. We thank you that you are in control. We thank you that uh, you are sovereign over all, that there's not a single uh, army, not a single government, not a single law that can thwart you that can slow you down. And Lord, we, we look at it from our perspective so often and we can grow uh, quickly frightened. But we don't need to, Lord God, because we are safe in your hands. You are the God 
who topples governments and, and nations. You are, are the God who uh, always saves a remnant whose truth continues to march on even in the face of, of overwhelming uh, opposition. God, help us to remember this. Lord, uh, we don't like the direction our country is going necessarily. Lord God, we pray that you will continue to, uh, to guide us, that you will continue to protect your people. And, and Lord, we pray that you would uh, be at work within our government, that this would be uh, not abused, that this would not become an opportunity for, uh, for people just to attack churches more and more. God, we pray your hand of protection upon us in those ways. God, help us to stand firm as a body, locally and nationally. Lord, that we might um, just continue to hold forth the truth, even when it's scary, even if there's consequences. Help us to stand strong, Lord God. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. Help us to respond with faithfulness, we pray. God, can just continue before us this morning. Go before us now as we look into your word. Challenge us. Speak to us. Speak to our hearts. Um, we, need, we need to hear from you. There's so many things around us that are out of control. We need a word from you. Um, help us to be attentive, Lord. And I just pray this in the most holy and, and precious name of your Son. Amen. For the past uh, decade or so, there's been a growing group of vegetarians who, oddly enough, eat meat. Who knew? Uh, this doesn't seem to be a very vegetarian thing to do, uh, if you ask me. Now, it's not like they eat meat all the time, but, you know, just every now and then. Like maybe a cheeseburger once a month, or, you know, some bacon on, on Saturdays or as some do, just six days a week, uh, going meatless on Mondays. And this has become such a, a common thing that there is even now a name for these people. They are flexitarians. <laughs> I, I, I wish I was making this up, but I'm not. They are flexible vegetarians. These are people who largely subscribe to vegetarian ideals and, and beliefs, but just can't seem to get away from a few of their favorites. As one person said, I really do like vegetarian food, but I'm just not 100% committed. She also added that, I really like sausage. <laughs> now, of course, this has created controversy in the vegetarian world. How can you be a vegetarian if you still eat meat? That is a very good point. In their defense, flexitarians say that, you know, at least they are doing something. They're eating less meat, and the meat they eat is from more ethical sources, and so that should count for something. What an interesting concept. I want to be a part of this group. I just don't really want to do what they stand for. We live in a time of flexitarian Christianity. We know this. We've talked about this uh, before. More and more, people want to pick and choose which, which doctrines that they believe in, the character of their God, the commandments that they think uh, that they need to obey, and of course, the commitment level that they want to have. All like it's just some sort of buffet. You know, yeah, I want an all-loving God, not, no, none of that judgment stuff, uh, definitely no, no hell, uh, one who allows me to sleep around with whoever I want to sleep with, uh, where I can minister to my neighbor in a way that, you know, I get something out of it, and uh, oh yeah, I'd also like only about a 50% commitment level to my church, kind of like a, a Diet Coke at the end of a, a supersized meal, Right? And don't think that this is an outlandish scenario. Um, this is the reality for a growing number of people, of Christians. Many like the idea of, of Christianity, of salvation, eh, but they're just not 100% committed. Besides, they really like sinning. Flexitarianism. 
we can be, as Christians, so much like those people who go meatless six, you know, one day of the week, and then the other six days are just chomping down on all the bacon that they can find. We so often really want to be included in this group. We just don't really want to do what they stand for. God does not call us to a flexitarian faith, however. Uh, Just the opposite, in fact. And and as I was seeking for a a theme for this year, something that we could focus on together, be challenged in, be encouraged in, and, and whatnot, this was the direction that I really felt God guiding me in. The need to be truly committed to him. What does it actually look like to live committed to our Lord? What does that, what does that mean? 24-7, 365 days a year, what does that mean? And, and so as I was wrestling with this and, and praying and hopefully giving it the proper consideration, uh, I was led to to this as as a theme, and our theme for this year is going to be the crucified life. The crucified life. And the verse that I really felt the Lord leading me to in this regard was Galatians 2.20, as Barb just read. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me and the life I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So what we're going to do this morning is just take a a, a gentle introductory look, gentle or the word, uh, we're just going to take an introductory look at this and uh, see if I can explain kind of the direction where we're going in. So turn uh, to Galatians if you haven't already, and we're just going to start with a a bit of uh, context here. Now, in this letter to the Galatians, uh, Paul is addressing an issue that is essentially the same as the one that we face today. People are wanting to serve God on their own terms. Now, in that particular case, quite different. Uh, Some of the people were reverting back to a very works-based Salvation. They were trusting their own ability to keep the laws uh, well enough um, to please their mistaken understanding of God. Now, it is isn't still pretty much what we do today, too. It, it really boils down to, you know, it's all about us. It's all about our sensibilities. It's all about, you know, our efforts. And we can see this even, you know, with the kind of lax faith that so many people want. Uh, So these situations really in in so many ways are identical. And and we see that after providing proof of his orthodoxy, you know, he had been confirmed both by God and by some of um, major leaders in the early church as to being someone who was holding on to the truth. We see that Paul recounts how he had to uh, rebuke Peter and Barnabas for falling back into legalism. And then he goes and he explains why he had to do this. And I know verses 15 and following can be a a little hard to understand in places, but just to summarize, Paul is again reminding his readers that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone. It's not from our background, it's not from our culture, it's not from our ability to live up to some sort of external standards that, that we have decided are the most important ones to the Lord. It, it's, all, it, it's all about grace and faith. And, and then he, he goes on, and in verse you know, 19, he, he reminds us uh, of the real purpose of the law. The real purpose of the law is to show us that it's impossible to follow the law on our own efforts. It's impossible to to please God and to meet his perfect standards on our own. And we absolutely, completely need him and his grace. And, And because Paul had learned this lesson himself from the law, he stopped trusting in his own ability to fulfill the law. And he turned to God. He says, for through the law, through my understanding of the law, through seeing what the law was, I died to the law. I decided, nope, There's no way I can live up to this so that I might live to God. Now, he's not saying here that he was released from God's moral standards. He was released from righteousness. 
uh, he just recognized that he was not able to attain these things on his own. And so with that kind of context and background, we now get to our theme verse. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Now there's so many things to look at here, we don't have that kind of time, so we're just going to go through it quickly, if we can. First of all, I have been crucified with Christ. The reason that Paul no longer lives according to the law and no longer tries to appease God according to his own ability is because of what Jesus did by dying and rising up again. Our sins, past, present, and future, have all been placed on him. He died in our place. And our penalty, death, has been paid. We are no longer condemned. And in a way, God looks at us as if we were the ones who had been on the cross. And this is what Paul really means when he says, I have been crucified with Christ. He is, he is uh, acknowledging the immense, the profound, the stunning reality that Jesus stood in for him, identified with him, took his punishment. All the work has been done, which is uh, an amazingly humbling thought. He's joined with Christ in his death. And because of this tremendous sacrifice on his behalf, Paul then says, it is no longer I who lives, who live, but Christ lives in me. And this wasn't just some sort of theoretical concept he was trying to get across here, not just some flowery turn of phrase, not you know, some sort of superficial expression of thanks. This is a very serious reality. Believers are united with Christ in the most amazing ways. Uh, by receiving this glorious salvation that Jesus purchased, Paul understands that this is a complete submission to the sovereignty of his will. He goes, Christ lives in me. He's come in, he takes over. You know, we can't choose to identify only with his death and then pay very little heed to this new life that has been uh, created within us. It, it does not work that way. We now have a new master in residence, is what Paul is saying here. Before, we were slaves to sin. We were under its authority. We were destined for death. Now, we are slaves to Christ. He's the master. We are under his authority. We are promised eternal life. And so we have this need to submit fully. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Now, of course, having Christ come in and live within us doesn't mean that we're immediately released from the, uh, uh, the temptation or the ability to sin. I wish. It doesn't quite work that way. We are still in broken bodies. We still live in a, in a sinful world. And while we've been made holy from the, the moment of our salvation, holy before God, um, you know, we, our, our, sanctif our sanctification is still an ongoing process as long as we remain on this earth. We remain responsible to, uh, for our own effort to submit to God's will, to live in a way that is pleasing to him. And, and Paul recognizes that even as Christ lives with, within him, and, and he recognizes the guidance and the strength uh, that God provides in this task, he still has a responsibility. Listen to how he says, the life which I now live in the flesh. He recognizes, yeah, I'm still living here. I live by faith in the Son of God. He takes personal responsibility there. He understands, you know, I'm not going to trust anything else anymore. I'm not going to trust myself, my wisdom, my deeds. I'm only going to trust God alone. I will strive to submit to him and to his ways. And then one final thing is we see that this is done willingly 
out of tremendous gratitude for the God who loved me. Think about that for a second. The Almighty God of all creation loved Paul. So much so that, that he came and he gave himself up. I love how it says he gave himself up. He surrendered for us. What other response then can there be but to willingly and gratefully surrender our life as well? You know, if, if, if that isn't reason enough for us to give tremendous thanks constantly and to change our lives and to serve him willingly, then there is absolutely nothing on this earth that is worthy of our gratitude. If we can thank somebody for being nice to us in a store, you know, think about it. They've just done a tiny little thing for us. How much more should we be grateful to, to our Lord? I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives with me, within me. And, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And, and so what Paul is describing here really, is, it's the polar opposite of a flexitarian faith. This is a serious call to willingly, uh, uh, gratefully identify fully with the God who chose to identify fully with us. It's a call to relinquish control of, of all that we are to him, to submit to his will, and to recognize our complete dependence upon him for our salvation. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And when we start looking at this and we start considering this call, we can see why, you know, this isn't exactly a popular message at all. You know what? This can sound a little difficult, right? This can sound a little miserable. This is hard. And, and yet throughout the Bible, throughout this, which is a fantastic gospel of hope and peace and, and, and life, we see this exact same message of being called to a complete holiness and to a complete faithfulness to God. Start in, uh, uh, you know, Exodus, we are no other gods, not to have any other gods, right? You go through the Old Testament, oh, we see over and over, does not want a ritualistic, half-hearted faith. Go to uh, Revelation. Yeah, no, no lukewarm. No lukewarm. Be useful or I'll spew you out. If you're just useless, got no use for you whatsoever. Uh, gone. And Jesus also spoke about this numerous times as well, even using this same analogy, the same imagery of a cross that, that Paul does later. So turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 16 for a moment. And... Uh, it kind of further clarifies what Paul is saying to us here. In verse 24, Jesus says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's our calling. That's, that's the calling he gave to the disciples, that's the calling he gives to us, and that is what Paul is saying that he is doing and urging us to as well. So, so what does Jesus mean here when he says that we are to not deny ourselves? You know, he's not saying that we have to give up every sort of, you know, modern convenience or anything that, that's enjoyable, even if it's not sinful, for the sake of some sort of, you know, weird austerity and, and, and self-denial thing. You know, the, the, the images we get of, you know, the, the stereotypical monk who leaves everything behind and goes and lives in seclusion with just one set of clothes and a spoon and his Bible. Or, or maybe we think of the Amish, you know, where uh, driving a, a car with rubber wheels is just a little bit too worldly. Um, that is not what he means at all. Starting about midway through verse 21, we see that he's teaching his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised up on the third day. Verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. What was Jesus' response to that? Well, Jesus turned around and he rebuked Peter right back. He says, you are not setting your mind on God's interests, 
but man's. Which is then followed by the statement about denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following him. New Testament scholar Dr. Walter Liefeld uh, writes the following, this means that as Christians we will not set our desires and our will against the right Christ has to our lives. Furthermore, we are to recognize that we now live for the sake of Christ, not for our own sake. Thus to be crucified with Christ, to deny ourselves and to take up our cross means that that we and our desires and our plans for our lives now are secondary to God's will and desires and plans for our lives in every way. And Jesus demonstrates this himself in Luke chapter um, 22. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying, and he knows uh, what is coming. He's got a betrayal by a friend coming up, and then, you know, he's got the cowardice, even the denial of, of his dear disciples. There's going to be major injustice and, and, you know, horrendous physical abuse, and then an excruciating death uh, on a cross. Worst of all, though, would be having the sin of the world placed upon him and then for the first and only time ever feeling the separation from the Father. And we read that he was in absolute agony about this. Uh, you know, he knows this is to come and, and he's just he's praying so hard about this. And, and I think we can, in a tiny, tiny way, imagine what he's going through uh, because um, we've all had hard times where we we haven't exactly liked the path that God was leading us down. We knew where it was going. We didn't like it. But despite that, what do we see that Jesus prayed here? He said, he prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. See, it wasn't about him. It was about God's will. And so as we, we gather all of these threads together. This is the crucified life. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. And and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. We, We believe, we follow, we obey, we submit to him. We see the world through his eyes rather than our own. You you would think that wouldn't be such a radical thought, wouldn't you, right? Uh, You know, that the holy God who who graciously saved us from our own sinfulness would would desire an appropriate response. That the the almighty God of, of all the universe, the one who knows absolutely everything, uh, would actually desire that we do what he says. And yet here we are. We like our flexitarian faith, and we justify it by saying, well, you know what, at least I'm doing something. You know, we're sinning a little less, sinning a little more ethically than the next guy. We have better morals than those people, and so that should count for something. Sorry, but God is is not looking for what we, as sinful humans, would consider to be good morals. He doesn't care how we subjectively measure ourselves relative to other people. He's looking for a crucified life lived by faith. So what does this look like? What, what are we gonna be looking at then this year? What kind of topics? Oh my goodness, uh, lots of things. Uh, we're gonna be looking at things like putting our sin to death, seriously, all of it. Getting rid of it. Denying those, those sinful urges and actions and, and reactions. Taking a stand for the truth. Recognizing sin for what it really is. It's defiance of the holy God who saves us. You know, by um, accepting his salvation, we are united to him in it, which should lead us to live our lives daily doing what he did once and for all, and that is putting sin to death. 
How can we accept his death, which paid for our sins on our behalf, and then continue to live in those exact same sins? That would imply that we either believe our sins aren't so bad or that his death wasn't completely necessary. Both of those thoughts are nonsense. We no longer live for ourselves. We no longer live according to our, own, our old sin nature. We surrender to his sovereignty. We're going to be looking at things like developing the fruit of the Spirit. You want to hear something crazy? The fruit of the Spirit aren't optional. Who knew? You know, when you go to Galatians 5, 22 and 23, there's not a little asterisk at the end of that list, and then you follow that down to the bottom of the page, and it goes, eh, well, if you feel like it. Or, you know, so long as, you know, it's not too hard and people aren't really being jerks, right? It doesn't say that. It does not say that at all. Do you know what verse 24 says? After this beautiful list that tells us that we are to develop, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Guess what the next verse says? It says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. The crucified life is surrendering to his will. It's obeying. It is growing and developing in him. We're going to be looking at things like um, just bringing glory to our God, trusting him, living faithfully, pointing people towards him, even though everything in our life just seems to be upside down and wrong and messed up. It's living like we really mean that he's our savior, that he really is our God. We, we stop giving him the leftovers of our time and our energy and our, our finances. We stop being concerned that something interests us before we obediently follow in a ministry, getting involved. You know, we quit worrying about potential social and, and financial costs and concerns that may in, uh, arise from following Christ. And instead, we want to set our hearts, our minds, on his interests and his glory. We follow him wherever he leads. We make evangelism and the building up of others a serious priority. We take joy in his service. This is the crucified life. And we'll probably be looking at a few other things too as we go along. But this is what we wanna strive for. I, I, I know this sounds hard. Uh, there's a reason that Jesus and Paul used the cross uh, as the analogy here, uh, because it's painful. It's going to be a struggle. It's not easy. And, and this is why so many of us prefer to be flexitarian when it comes to our faith. The, the crucified life sounds like fanaticism, right? It sounds like that is just a bridge too far. You know what? There are sins that we actually enjoy. We like doing them. There's, there's things that we just, nah, it's not that bad. What's wrong with that? And, and we can find ourselves wondering what the benefits uh, of this crucified life are. There are many, 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 many. And we'll be discovering some of those this year. Um, but looking back again to Matthew 16 gives us an amazing one. The reason we live like this is for our salvation. Just, just after Jesus told his disciples that they needed to take up his cross and follow him, he says, starting in, in verse 25, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father and with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Sure, we can live the way we want. We can accomplish maybe some absolutely fantastic things. Think about gaining the whole world, having absolutely everything that you ever wanted. But what does it matter if it means that our current relationship with the Lord or you know, our, our, our potential future reward or even our eternal life is lost. 
You know, sure, it can be easier in some ways just to kind of glide along, but is it worth the price? We're not talking about earning our salvation. I want to make that clear because that's impossible. Salvation is a free gift completely by grace through faith. And all we have to do is believe in him. But you know what? Part of believing in him is actually believing in him. If we have little or no desire to fully identify with him, to submit to his will and to follow his ways, have we truly accepted him as our Lord and Savior. This isn't fanaticism I'm talking about. This is worshipful obedience. This is a delight. This is a source of great hope. We are embracing the God who loves us and gave himself up for us. We just want to submit to his lordship. You know, Paul had a, a, a deep relationship with, with Christ who, even while Paul was on this journey with a rather murderous intention, uh, miraculously appeared to him and, and brought him to the truth. What an amazing thing. And, and, and through this experience and through, you know, Paul was already a rising Pharisee, very well educated, knew the scriptures, and through these things, he was able to grasp just how gracious God is, how great his salvation was, the amazing price that Jesus paid for that, and what the only appropriate response to that saving grace is. That's 100% commitment. Paul got that. The only proper response is the crucified life. Because Jesus died for us, we now live for him. And so as we, we start 2022, I just want to challenge each of us to consider where we're at. How are we doing? Are we crucified with Christ? Do we identify completely with him as the only source of real and eternal life? You know, these are important questions, not just for now, but for all eternity. And it really is, man, I can't tell you how much I've prayed about this. Um, It is my prayer that we honestly seek to answer those questions throughout this year. And that we will more and more leave the, the flexitarian life behind. That we will be increasingly prepared to face an increasingly difficult world and that we would confidently move forward as a light in this dark place. That is my prayer. Uh, I hope you'll make that your prayer as well. Let's just pray briefly, and then we're going to go to a time of communion. Lord, um, thank you. What can we say? You've done everything. Absolutely everything. You could have immediately discarded us, but you chose not to. Instead, out of love and grace and mercy and holiness, you came down here, took our sins, placed them on yourself. You gave yourself up for us. that a God would do that for us is amazing. Lord, thank you for that reminder. Lord, it is so easy for us to just go with the flow, to take the easy route, to um, gloss over things so that we aren't made fun of, to seek after the things of the world. And yet, Lord, it's all pointless. The only thing of value is knowing you and serving you. God, help us this year as we move forward to live a crucified life. Lord God, just, um, I pray that you will be at work in our hearts. You will open our, our, our minds to the beauty of you and to the beauty of serving you in this way. God, go before us. Help us in this endeavor. 
Lord, we just want to become a body of believers that knows you, that lives free of all of the fear of this world that has that gone crazy around us. And Lord God, we want to be a beacon. We want to, we want to be tools that you use to rescue our family and our friends and our neighbors and our town. Help us, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, to just reflect you. Go before us now as we go into our little time of communion. Lord, speak to our hearts, we pray. I just pray all of this in, in Jesus' name. Amen. The crucified life seems to be, um, man, doesn't that seem to be hard and what's the point? Until, and there is an until, until you stop and remember the life that was crucified for us. And then all of a sudden, it doesn't seem to be so much, does it? You just, you know, stop and think for a second of the reality of the situation. I know we do this often. We need to do this often. We need to be reminded. We need to tell ourselves the gospel every day. Um, we are sinful by, by nature and by nurture. We, we were born into sin and, and we just thrive in that nonsense. And if you don't believe me, any of you with, with kids, did you teach your, your two-year-old to bite your one-year-old? Who taught them to do that? Nobody. It's in us. We're sinful. There's nothing we could do. Oh my goodness, God is so perfect and holy and, and beyond us. And, and for us to think that we could do anything on our own, that would make him go, okay, that's good enough. It's nonsense. Pure and utter drivel. But while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He came. He left behind the splendor of heaven. He deliberately, voluntarily, intentionally uh, uh, limited aspects of, of his glory. We don't exactly understand what that looks like, but he did so that he could be among us, born in the lowliest of, of manners, perfect God surrounded by nothing but sin and dishonesty and muck, lived a perfect life. He fulfilled the law. He was the only one who could fulfill the law of God. And then he died in our place. Why? So that our, our, our sins would be removed. So our guilt would be no more. So that we'd no longer be under condemnation whatsoever. So that his righteousness could be placed upon us. So that we could be rescued from an eternity of facing nothing but the wrath of God. Now when you stop and think about that. Really, is it a big step for us to like go, oh, Lord, I don't really want to give this much or I don't really want to do that much. Oh, good heavens, what are we thinking? He's done everything for us. He died for us so that we can live for him, or we should. So let's just take some time. Uh, communion with funny little cups and not passing things around and people at home is a little different. Um, but let's still take some time, take a minute, and let's just give thanks to our God for this gift, for the fact that he came down to earth for us, that we might have life. And it's a time of remembrance. And what are we to remember? Well, we remember what he did. Why? So that we can respond appropriately. I, I ask that we would pray that, that we would move forward on this year of, of trying to live a crucified life, that God would reveal to us what we need to do, what he's calling us to do, what we need to get rid of. So let's just take this time to, to consider his gift and to consider our, our response. And I'll, I'll give us about a minute or so.
Not that that's long enough, but I'll, that's what we'll do this morning. Amen. I have no idea if that was a minute or not. We're just going to say it was. I always like to read from 1 Corinthians. I don't know why. That's just my one of choice. Again, it's the words of Paul, just to remind us what it is that we're, we're doing here. And he said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way he took the cup also after supper saying this is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Let me just pray, give thanks to the Lord for this, uh, for, first for the little wafer. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for coming down to earth for us. Thank you for taking on our form. You are made in the likeness of man. With all of our limitations. You faced the same things that we had to face. You worked and you sweat and you probably got hurt and you did all those things. You fulfilled the law. And then you suffered the greatest injustice of all time. Innocent, you were convicted. You were beaten and abused and mocked and reviled. Then you are put to death on a cross. Why? So that we could have life. Thank you, Lord God, for your body, which was broken for us. Help us, Lord God, be very mindful of what it is that you've done. Amen. This little wafer symbolizes the body of Christ which was broken for us. Let's do this in remembrance of him. And now, because it seems to be the Daniel and Ben show today, I will give thanks for the cup. Lord God, thank you as well for this little cup of juice. Lord, there were covenants in the Old Testament. You are always faithful to your covenants. We, we, very much less so. 
This represents a new covenant, a covenant of grace. Lord, we don't have to make all those sacrifices anymore. We are, are freed because you made the, the ultimate sacrifice. Thank you for dying on the cross, for shedding your blood that we might have life. Make us, Lord God, very mindful of what this means. Help us to live appropriately in return. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This cup represents the new covenant, his blood. Let's drink this in remembrance of him. Ben, please come and lead us. Just stand with us for one last song. He is for you. He is for you. He is for you. 
He is for you. He is for you. He is for you. He is for you. Thanks for, thanks for coming and joining with us this morning, worshiping together, and uh, hopefully learning and growing together to encourage one another around you. That's just what I'm telling you to do. Um, if there's anything we can do to encourage you or to help you in some way, let us know. We delight in doing such things. One reminder that I want to make is um, don't forget to check the adjustments to the, the changes to the Constitution and uh, let us know what you're thinking. Uh, in closing, by way of benediction, oh, I pray that this great, amazing love that the Father has for us will perma just permeate our hearts and our lives, that we would understand the fullness of who he is and what he's done for us, and we would live appropriately in response. Amen. God bless. Y'all are dismissed. <laughs> May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you, He is with you in the morning, in the evening, in your coming, and your going, in your weeping and rejoicing. He is for you, 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 He is for you.